serve an awesome, awesome God. Through the good times and the bad times, God doesn't change as often. But it feels like you know, at times he's further away than others. But uh, we know he's not. Well, good evening. James, can you turn the light up in here, please? I feel like I'm... That's perfect. Turn it back on, please. Turn it up. Wrong one. There we go. And then there was light. Someone's got to say it, so I'm going to do it. So, Daniel, can you hear me? Am I going to? Am I, am I good? Okay. Awesome. Well, for all you guys out there that are watching and on recording, sorry for all of that technical garble. Uh, we were just trying to make sure the sound was working. We had a big storm, and, well, somewhat big storm, and here in Geekland, and so we're having some internet issues. I think we're good to go now. Well, glad everyone's here tonight. Tonight we're going to start a new book. We're going to start the book of Numbers. And so uh, if you've never read the book of Numbers, um, I am famous for saying every time I teach, this is one of my favorite books. Well, guess what? This is one of my favorite books. Um, the, uh, but we're going to do, do something a little different as we start. Sometimes we, we normally give a little bit of an overview. This time we're going to give a little bit deeper overview into the book of Numbers. Um, so that as you go through it week after week after week, as, as David is uh, going to be picking up in chapter 2 next week, as you go through it, you, there's some questions you can be asking yourself. There's some things you can be looking for. There's some things you can be aware of going into it. So you can put it into context. Um, because, you know, right now we're in the process. We're going through the first five books, the Pentateuch. And we've obviously finished Genesis, Exodus, and last a couple weeks ago, Leviticus. And this week we're heading into Numbers. So let's open in prayer, and then we will get right into it. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your word, Lord. I thank you for each person that is here this evening, Lord, that uh, made the time to get out, Father God, and to be in fellowship, to, uh, to be here to hear your word, Lord, and, and to just um, to be in your presence, Father God. We're just so excited that you're here with us, Lord, that we're not just a bunch of people gathering in a building, uh, talking to the wind, Lord. We know that your spirit is here, and we thank you for that, Father God. Bless this study and met, make these words your words, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do a, an overview. Probably going to take 15, 20 minutes. 15, 20 minutes. And then we're going to do chapter 1, which is going to take 10 or 15 minutes. Chapter 1 is actually um, a lot of the same stuff, repeated, 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 repeated. Even though it's 54 verses long, uh, a lot of it's really just going through some minutia, but sort of repeating the same thing, but giving you a little new information each time. So the book of Hebrew is... Um, I mean, the book of Numbers uh, by the Hebrews is called In the Wilderness. They call it In the Wilderness. They, the, the Hebrew name for it is uh, B. Midbar. So that's what they called it when it, was, when it was written, when they were first going through it. 200 years before Jesus was born, 70 or 72 scholars, Greek scholars, got together, and they said, guess what? We're going to translate this into Greek from Hebrew. And they said, you know what? We're going to know it as arithmoi basically arithmetic. Right, okay, sounds good. And then, a little later on, when it was translated into Latin, it was called numeri, meaning numbers. And this is where we have it. We're, we're the book of numbers. Now, the English title numbers comes from the two censuses that are central features of the book. So we're going to see one really at the beginning, and then we're going to see one later on in the book, actually much later in, in the book of numbers. Um, however, the Hebrew title, In the Wilderness, is probably a little more descriptive of, of the book, a better description of what's going on in the book. Uh, Numbers tells how people, God's people traveled from Mount Sinai to the border of the Promised Land, to the border of Canaan. And then when they got there, what did they do? They refused to take the land, just like a real quick overview. And God made them wander in the wilderness for nearly 39 years. It's a long time to wander. And so throughout this book, we see that God is holy God who cannot be ignored and, and rebellion and unbelief is not going to be tolerated. 
but we also see one, a God who is faithful, he keeps his covenant, and he patiently provides for the people and their needs, even though they rebelled. Numbers ends with a new generation preparing for the conquest of Canaan, and traditionally Jews and Christians recognize Moses as the author of the book, uh, written during the final years of his life. Um, the, um, whereas Leviticus covered 30 days, one month. Hard to believe that entire book was a, a, it's basically a month is what it was. The book of Numbers covers 38 years. So when we go back and we look, what do we see? We see that we have Genesis covering approximately 2,300 years. We have uh, uh, Exodus that covers about, um, uh, about 40 years. And then we have... Um, uh, after that, we have uh, Leviticus, which covers 30 days a month. And now we're entering to a 38-year process that guys should go through this book. Yet what's in interesting out of the book is it gives us a very limited amount of insight into what occurred during that 38-year period. So though it's history, understand that the, the Bible is not a history book in the sense that it's going to tell you every little thing that happened. In, in the life of the Israelites as they're traveling through Canaan, I mean, traveling through the, through the desert to get to Canaan. It's just giving you the stuff that God needs you to know, right? As we go through the Bible, there's a lot of stuff that's obviously left out, but there's the things that are in there are in there for a purpose. They're not in there just to be randomly placed. So, the, um, as you've heard, the, the children of Israel are going to wander in this wilderness for about 30, 38, 39 years, and this book, this book of Numbers, is going to tell that story. So Numbers follows Moses and Israel's journey, basically from the foot of Mount Sinai. So because we finish up the book of Leviticus, they're sitting at the mount, at the base of Mount Sinai. They've got the tabernacle there. They're doing their thing. And, and then it travels all the way to the edge of Canaan. We get to right before they're going to cross over into the, into the land, the promised land. And if this was a normal trip, they were just doing their normal thing. If you and I were going to walk it from Mount Sinai to Canaan border, it'd be about 11, 12 days, two weeks max. For me, maybe a little longer. But, because I take my time. But still, it's not 38, 39 years of travel. So that tells you how much they're sort of, if you watch their path, it's sort of just travel, stop, travel, stop, circle back around, travel. It's like, wow, where are these people going? Where are they going? But God has a plan in that. So the, the, the upside in that is we can look and go, you know, sometimes our life seems like it's off course. Like, where am I, Lord? What is going on in my life? God's got a plan. We just may not be paying attention to that plan. Maybe he's waiting for us to catch up to his plan. So, but the Israelites, they needed some time to catch up. They, they decided, you know, they were going to do things their own way. And this, this caused them some problems. So why does it take them this long? Why does it take 40 years to get out of this desert, Right? So the people get halfway there. This is there again. This is just a real quick overview. People get halfway there, and Moses says, I'm going to send out some spies. I'm going to prep ahead of time. I'm going to send these guys out. You're going to go into the land of Canaan. You're going to come back and tell us how awesome it is. You're going to tell us about our adversaries, who we're going to face, how big are they, and all that kind of stuff. And then from there, we're going to prep to go in and take this land that's been promised to us by God. So he sends them out. And uh, I'm sure that the, the adversaries, the, the people that were the inhabitants of the land, weren't going to be super welcoming. So they had to kind of slink around and look and see what's going on and kind of spy on the people. And when they come back, 10 of the 12 spies come back, and what do they do? Oh, my gosh, these people are, whoa, there's no way we can take them on. They're, uh, there's no way. We're going to fail. We can't do this, Moses. We're all going to die. Look at these people. They're all going to die. And two people. Remember who those two were? Joshua and Caleb, right? Two of the spies. They came back and said, oh, dude, we can do this. We got this. Because why? Why did they do that? They believed God was a God of his word, right? And the others were, they did what we do a lot of times when we see things ahead of us. We see obstacles. We panic. How many people here have panicked when they've had a problem, Right? Oh, my gosh, I can't do this. What's going to happen? The world's going to collapse. I don't have money. I'm the, I, whatever it may be. Whatever the problem is, we as humans, we panic. And we fail to stop and go, wait a minute. God can handle this. 
me ask God to take care of this. That doesn't mean he's going to handle it in the way we want him to take care of it. He's not going to be, oh, you need a new car. Let me get you a new car. He's not a sugar daddy, <laughs> right? He, he's God, and he has a perfect plan. So sometimes our desires aren't his desires, and so that's not what we're going to get. We're not going to get our desire. But he's still got the perfect plan. But even with that perfect plan, we, we panic, and we run the other direction. And we're like, we can't do this. We're going to die. Everything the world, you know, we're, we're chicken little. Sky's collapsing. But that's okay. God, even when we act crazy, he's still on his throne going, okay, I'll, let's just let's give him some time. So 38 years is what he gives them. Gives them 38 years to do that. So hopefully if you guys are suffering from anything, if you're cha challenged anything, you're, you're having things that seem overwhelming, I'm hoping for your sake we'll be praying afterwards that it won't be 38 years of waiting. So, but if we're, if we're hard-headed, it could be longer than 38 years. It could be an entire lifetime, Right? So anyway, this leads to a rebellion within the people. They, they refuse to go take the land. Hard to believe. They've seen everything God's been doing. I mean, they literally saw God, his, his, his presence on the mountain. They were terrified of God on that mountain. They're like, okay, Moses, you know what? I'd really like you to go up there and talk to him. We belong. You go talk to him. Come back and tell us what he said. No, that's how scared they were. He came down and sat in the tabernacle. He sat in the tabernacle. His presence was there. The cloud was there. It wasn't like some random cloud that just showed up, and they go, oh, look, the cloud just randomly showed up. Every time God's presence was there, the cloud would show up, right? But these people are like, oh, God, you know, we've got to get out of here. They'd seen the, the, the Red Sea separated. They'd seen the entire Egyptian army crushed, the most powerful army in the world, crushed in a moment. They'd been freed from 400 and some years of slavery. But like most people, we have short memories. We forget the things that God has done for us. And I encourage people to keep a prayer journal so you can see the, the landmarks in your walk with the Lord where you've prayed and he's answered, and you've prayed and he's answered, and you've prayed and he's answered. You can go, you know what? I need to go back to that prayer journal. I need to look at that thing and remind myself of how great the God is that I serve. Right? So this is what they didn't do. They didn't have their prayer journal. They blew it. So, but God gives them their wish. He says, you don't want to go on the land? Okay, that's fine. And he says, this whole generation will die in the wilderness. The entire generation. Can you imagine? You're, all, you're looking around, you're the new generation. You're like, hey, I can't go into the promised land until that dude dies. You know, he was the old generation. People are watching you, waiting for you to die maybe. You're like, yeah, exactly. Out with the old Ruthie. I mean, it's like, look, this isn't, we're not moving forward until you're all dead. That's a horrible way to look at it, but that's what they wanted. They had requested, don't send me into the promised land. It's too much. We can't handle this. So God said, fine. He was, but, but the neat thing about that is God wasn't giving up on his covenant, his promise. He was just saying, for now, you're not going in. You won't see it. Okay? So there's some, some important characters we want to talk about because they're going to be in the book, and we want to make sure you're, you're aware of them. So the first one, big surprise, God. Yahweh, right? He's the one that chose Israel as a special nation, and he dwelt among them. Need to remember that. This whole time, God has, is dwelling amongst the people of Israel. They're not alone. They're able to see his presence. He leaves in my cloud, right? This is a fire at night, clouds in the day. And they still, well, I don't know if we can do this. I don't think we can do this. Moses, right? He's the prophet. He's the human leader of the people of Israel. He's going to be there, and he's the spokesperson for God. Aaron, Moses' brother, he's the high priest. Okay? Eleazar is going to take over one day. He's Aaron's oldest son. Well, the one that's left. The oldest son that's still alive. He's going to take over as the high priest once his father dies. Balaam, he's a diviner. He's a, he's a pagan prophet, if you will. And... He basically is for hire. He gets hired by people to divine, to, to call on spirits and the like. And uh, he's called to curse God's people later on in the book. If you remember the donkey talking and the man talking to the donkey and the man thinking that talking to a donkey was normal, that's Balaam, right? And so, and then there's Joshua. Um, he's Moses' aide who goes and spies on the land. And then God, this is key, 
God selects him to succeed, um, to be the successor to, to Moses. It wasn't like they had a vote. They said, you know, we, all, we really like Jacob. He's a really cool, cool. We like Joshua. He's really cool. No, God said, you know what? Joshua is the man for the job, and he let Moses know that. So that's important. God chose Moses. God chose Aaron. God chose Joshua. These aren't man-made decisions. Just like God later on chooses David, even though when by man's standards they looked at someone else. But God said, no, David's the man. So there's a lot of weird things that go on in this journey, right? Including, I could talk about the, the donkey that's talking, sort of a Shrek moment there. If you ever seen Shrek, you know, donkey, right? So he's talking to this donkey. Donkey's talking back. Uh, but the main focus there, again, is the repeated rebellion and God's repeated mercy and discipline on his people. Like a good parent, you can be loving and merciful, but still discipline your child. Okay? So some people go, well, I can't be loving if I discipline my child. You know, or I need to discipline them, but I, you know, I need to be hard on them. God is just, he's, just, he's loving and he's merciful in his discipline? Because he could have just said, you know what, I'm sick of this. I'm done. He's, I mean, he's, there are times in the Bible where he's sort of like, I'm done with these people. Let's just wipe them out, Moses, and let's start again. And Moses is like, no, that's not a good idea, God. You know, and he's, and he, he begs on behalf of the people not to have them, you know, killed. But there again, that, that, uh, that, that's what we're going to see throughout this. Numbers 14, ch- chapter 14, verse 11 is going to be sort of, I would say, to me, it kind of sums up the key themes in this book. And here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs that I have performed in their midst? That sums up the whole book. It's like, man, how many things does he have to do? You know, so can you imagine constantly doing good things for someone and the person's like, I don't really know if you like me or not. Look at all the things I've done. You know, well, I don't know if I can trust, un- trust you to come help me if I'm in trouble. Do you remember that time you broke down at 3 a.m. and I got in my car and I drove 25 hours away to come to your car and help you change the tire and get you somewhere safe? It's the same sort of deal. God's like, I don't understand. Well, he understands. But God's like, what's going on? How long is this, this ridiculousness going to happen? So... Anyway, so going through here, we're going to see a few things going on in the book. We're going to see human rebellion. We've already talked a little bit about that, right? They rebel continuously on multiple occasions against God and Moses. It's not just God. They also rebel against Moses as well. They complain about food. They complain about water. They complain about that they'll be crushed by their enemies. They complain about Moses. And on a few occasions, make some death threats. Okay? But then there's divine punishment we're going to see. When the people complain, God hears them. So when we complain, remember, God can hear us. We don't complain in a vacuum. We're no, and God's like, I didn't hear what he said. God knows when we're complaining, and quite honestly, it's a sin. You know, we have so many things to be grateful for. So when we have a complaining heart, a griping heart, we're sinning against the Lord. He's like, I've given you the breath in your lungs. Be thankful. So... Anyway, has stories of God killing uh, rebellious Israelites with fire. Kind of cool. Uh, plagues and snakes. Everyone's favorite. I wish Amy was here because I know she likes snakes. So that he, he sends snakes as well. And then sometimes Moses calls on God and says, I really need your help because the people are turning on me. And so God punishes them directly. So we're going to see a bunch of that. Divine provision, you know, obviously... Um, even though rebellious, God proves to be merciful. He provides for them in the desert. They make it 38 years, actually 40 years total, out there in the desert. It's not like they had crops growing. few crops they could stop at or, or a nice big Target grocery store or something. They, they had to depend on the Lord for what they could find. You know, we're talking, we're talking desert. We're not talking, you know, it would be a different thing if they were in lush greens and all kinds of food was there and deer were running wild like all over the place and that's not the case they they have they they need him to preserve them so rather than killing off the uh, whole nation here in the wilderness he waits for the rebellious generation to die and he preserves the younger people that's really what he's preserving i mean i know it sounds kind of harsh but it's like these people are going to have to die off the old generation and so the new generation is what he's preserving he's preserving the people that are going to help him fulfill 
his promise to give them the uh, give them the, the promised land. Right? So he provides what? Provides manna. That's kind of cool. Don't have to do anything for it. Just show up, get up, eat. Right? And then he even prevents Balaam, who's a prophet, from being able to curse them. Now, they don't know that until later, but that's actually pretty cool. Um, and then finally, we'll see Moses' leadership. You know, he deals with the pressures of leading a new nation, a new group of people. They haven't been that long since they were slaves. It's only been a year. So they were slaves. They don't really know how to do a lot of things. It'd be like you just, you know, you're being our age, let's say. And they go, hey, guess what? You got a new nation. Do something with it. Well, what do I do? I haven't been trained to do any of this stuff. And we see that as real world examples in different parts of the world where different countries who may have had dominion over that country for a while, even in the 21st, uh, 20th century, where they backed out, England leaving Kenya. Those people hadn't been trained on how to run a country. And they left. And if you've ever been to Kenya, you're like, they didn't do a good job of running it. They haven't done a good job of running it, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's run down. And so these people, you know, they're a year out of being slaves. They don't know how to be warriors. Uh, there's so many things that they don't know. And so Moses has got to lead them through this. So, and, and, and unfortunately for him, we're going to find out in this first chapter that there's uh, over 600,000 men, that doesn't include the women and children, that he's got to deal with. And they're the ones that are coming to him complaining. 600,000 plus guys. Wap, 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 wap. Like a bad Charlie Brown thing. All the time, just squawking at him. How about this? How about that? And he, and he, knows, he knows who God is. And he's like, what, what's wrong with you people? Don't you see the God we serve? So he's got some, he's got some serious issues with the people. And I'm sure that's, that's frustrating. You know, we have children. When our children, we've told them one thing and they do the exact opposite thing. It's irritating. Come on, I told you not to put your hand on the hot stove. Now I'm taking you to the doctor because you burned yourself real good. So Moses is telling them all this stuff, and God has told them all this stuff through Moses, and yet they go and do exactly the opposite thing. They continue to complain and whine. So one last thing, Numbers isn't a standalone book. We need to understand it's the fourth in a series of five books, right? We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're in the fourth one right now. And basically, this is uh, reading numbers without at least familiarizing yourself. And if you've been coming for the last few months, you've been very well familiarized because we've gone through Genesis, we've gone through Exodus, we've gone through Leviticus. But if you didn't have that, going into numbers, you'd be sort of like, it'd be like starting season three of a show. So you haven't seen the first two seasons. So you pick up in season three, you're like, who's this character? So you're sitting there talking with someone, you're watching the show with someone, they've seen the first two seasons, you haven't. And you're that irritating person that asks a million questions during the show. Who's that person? What do they do? Why are they doing that? Where are they at? Why would they do that? So numbers you need, I, I think it's very helpful to have gone through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus to get to where we are now um, so that you understand where they are and why they're there. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and... Jump right on into the first 54 verses, which is the entire book, uh, entire chapter of, of uh, Numbers 1. And we're going to start with Numbers 1, verses 1 through 3. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year. Oh, get that? Second year. After they had come out of the land of Egypt. So basically 14 months later. They've made it 14 months. And they're getting ready to leave from the base of Mount Sinai. And this is what the Lord says. Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel. Understand when he says that, he, what he's really saying is take a census of all the men. And the nation of Israel. By clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male head by head, from 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war, you and Aaron shall list them company by company. So the second month of the second year, so basically you're heading into your 14th month after the, the exodus, right? So they left Egypt about four, 13 months ago, heading into the 14th month. And now they have to start preparing for battle. So 
basically, if, if Genesis was, we could call that the book of beginnings, right? Anyone who's read that as we went through the book of beginnings. Exodus is that book of redemption. God's redeeming them from their slavery and the, and the nation of Israel, I mean, nation of Egypt. And Leviticus is the book of worship, where he set up how he's to be worshipped, how he's to be, how the sacrifices are to be made, where they're to be made, when they're to be made, why they're to be made, all that. The Numbers is the book of warfare. So for me, as a father of five boys, this is an awesome book to introduce my children to the Bible. This one, Joshua, 1 Kings, anywhere there's a little bit of violence and, and war going on. So... I'm not suggesting that everyone is good for, but I have four rough and tumble, I mean five rough and tumble boys, and these are this, gr- this is a great book to be in. And it shows the power of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord that he has with Israel as well. The Jews were in enemy territory marching towards a land that God would help them conquer. That's what they failed to remember, right? God's going to help them conquer it. And they had to organize for this confrontation and this conflict. Remember, 13 months ago, what were they? Slaves. They weren't taught how to fight. They weren't taught how to do anything hand-to-hand. The Egyptians weren't going to allow that. If they saw them practicing sword play, probably, or practicing judo or whatever, my guess is there was pretty severe consequences. Because otherwise, they'd be afraid you would rise up against them. you got to figure they outnumbered them already. There was a huge two million of them. You know, can you imagine two million people rising up? Yeah, there might be a lot of people on their side that die, but the other side is going to take a pretty good hit, too. So the Egyptians were scared of them. And we, we see that in, in Exodus. It talks about why they put them into slavery. They're like, they're so numerous, we need to put them into bondage. So, th- you know, these guys don't know anything about war. They don't know anything about, you know, uh, fire team tactics or, or how to make create a line to assault. or They don't know any of this stuff. But what you do see in this book is this phrase here. It says, the able to go forth to war, or some variation of that in your, your version. It's used 14 times in this chapter. So obviously, God has a plan here. He said, if he wants you to be able to go to war, be able-bodied, well, it's not because he's planning on having a building party. It's not going to be out there, you know, he's going to have to build some things, but, you know, they're going to have to do some fighting. When you go into this new land, God's going to go before them, but he's going to require them to work some as well. If God were to number the believers in the church today, that's something I was thinking. If he were to number the chur- believers in the church today according to their ability, our ability to wage spiritual warfare, I'm curious how big our army would be. You know? God said, number those who are able-bodied for spiritual warfare. What would our count be? 10,000? I'm talking the big C church. Is it a million? A billion? What is it? My guess is the number wouldn't be as big as we'd like it to be, right? All right. So over 150 times in the book of Numbers, it's recorded that God spoke to Moses and gave him instructions to share with the people. In fact, Numbers opens up here. Right here, we're seeing God giving Moses directions on what to do to speak to the people. And in the very last couple verses of, of, exi- I mean of uh, 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 Numbers, we're going to see him do the same thing again. So throughout this, he's constantly speaking to Moses and giving him instructions. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do with my people. Here's what I want you to tell my people. So that's what we see. So God has, uh, was, uh, has commanded that Moses, Aaron, and the tribal leaders, they're going to need to take this census. And so remember back in, in Exodus when uh, Moses was having issues with the people, trying to judge them and rule them. Remember his, his father-in-law, Jeff Rose, came and said, hey, dude, you've got to break these people up into tens, hundreds, thousands, you know, tribal, you gotta, you got to break this down. You can't, you can't do all this. So this is going to come into play here. God's going to use this breakout to figure out how many people are there. And we're going to look at that here. But he wants to make sure that it was made up of uh, able-bodied people that were actually Israelites. Now understand as you're reading this, this is not a volunteer army. This is mandatory service in the military, if you will, uh, at, at this time. And if you were 20 years, 20 years of age or older, you were going to be put down on the roster as being part of that army. And there was an expectation that when they went to war, had to defend anything or fight anything, you were part of that service, right? So then we, he's got that down. He's getting ready to start. And then in cha- on verse 4 it says, And there shall be with you a man from each tribe, each man being the head of the house of his father. So he's pulling in guys 
from each one of the tribes and saying, okay, I need a person from this tribe and that tribe. Every tribe is going to be represented. And then there's going to be a person for each one of the, the father's families coming in. So he's got all these guys, not just 12 guys ultimately. It's a bunch of guys who are going to be helping him to take this census. And they probably break up and take the censuses separately. Like, you know, you handle the tribe of Dan and you handle the tribe of Manasseh and the sort. But however they did it, they did this census. Now here's what's interesting about this. These leaders are going to know two things. They're going to know if you really are an Israelite, so you can't have some Yehu who happens to be tagging along because there were people that were sojourners that were with the Israelites. But if you weren't an Israelite, you weren't being counted. You weren't part of that army. doesn't mean you couldn't have later on joined in the fight, but you weren't part of that army. Second, you couldn't hide. So if you were a deserter type, you got the, it comes all the way down into the, you know, the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. The dude's like, hey, where's... Uh, Where's whoever? Where is he? Oh, he's hiding over there in the tent. Oh, let's get him up here. Let's make sure he's on the list. So there is no way he can desert on this. I mean, it was just down to the, the minutia. They knew everyone who was supposed to be there and be counted. So you weren't going to be hiding and getting away with hiding. So if you were a coward or just a pacifist or whatever you may be, uh, that wasn't going to be the case. They were going to call you out and get you. So verse 5. And these are the names of the men who shall assist you. So from verse 5 all the way down through verse uh, 15, it's going to list out each one of the men, one man, tribal leader for that, that, uh, that, that family. So basically Dan and Gad and, you know, and so forth and so on. They're all listed here, Asher. So you can go through those verses and, and see who those people are. And these are the ones chosen from the congregation, con- yeah, congregations the chiefs of their ancestral tribes, the heads of the clans of Israel. So these are the heads there that are doing this. And Moses and Aaron took these men, verse 17, took these men who had been named, and on the first day of the second month, they assembled the whole congregation together and registered themselves by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names from 20 years old and upward, head by head. So no male was missed. Okay? Now understand that later this list of people that are in this list right now are the ones that have to pass away before the new generation can go in. So everyone, every male that is in this census has to die before they will enter into the promised land. Okay, so every male 20 and older will be held accountable for their poor decision to not trust in the Lord and enter into Canaan except for two. It's two men whose name will be on here that will make it across that line. And that will be Joshua and Caleb. The only two on this list. Moses doesn't make it across. Aaron doesn't make it across. Aaron dies and his son takes over. Moses later on will see that even he sins against the Lord. And the Lord being a just God tells him, man, no matter how much I love you, Moses, you can't do that. You represented me poorly before the people. You aren't going into the promised land either. Right? So, man, we're seeing how much he loved Moses and how much he used Moses, but yet he punishes Moses. And, and rightfully. It was rightful punishment. Because he was given a position of authority. And, he, you know, it says, it says in the Bible in the New Testament about how teachers will be held to a different, higher standard, right? Well, Moses is held to a higher standard. Someone else who might have walked up and hit a rock might not have been banned from it promised land. But Moses was representing God when he did that, and God punished him for that. Verse 20. The people of of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, their generation by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, head by head, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who were to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Reuben were 46,500. Now, for the next several uh, verses, it's going to repeat itself for each one of the tribes. So, verse 23, those listed of the tribe of Simeon Simeon were 59,300. Those listed of the tribe of Gad were 45,650. Those listed for the tribe of Judah were 74,600. Those listed for the tribe of Issachar in verse 29 were 54,400. These are rounded up to the hundreds. The only one that's not, in, just in case you're curious, is, is Gad. And that was rounded to the closest 50. 
Those listed for the tribe of Zebulon were 57,400. Uh, verse 33, those listed for the tribe of Ephraim were 40,500. Those listed for the tribe of Manasseh were 32,200. Verse 37, those listed of the tribe of Benjamin were 35,400. And then verse 39, those listed of the tribe of Dan were 62,700. And those listed for the tribe of Asher were 41,500. And those listed for the, ver, uh, the tribe of Naphtali was 53,400. That was verse 43. And picking up in 44, those, these are those who were listed, whom Moses and Aaron listed with the help of the chiefs of Israel, 12 men, each representing his father's house, to all those listed of the people of Israel by their father's houses from 20 years old and upward, every man able to go to war. There again, able to go to war. This is why they're being listed. Uh, all those listed were 603,550. That's a lot of guys. That is a lot of guys. So we're not talking when they were planning to go over into Canaan that it was 20 of them or 20,000 of them, or 100,000 of them, or 500,000 of them, 603,000 men, able-bodied, now he says, what do you say? Able to go to war. Those are the ones that were counted. And yet they still didn't have, even with that, they didn't have faith that God would take care of them. What more do they need? What do they need? You know, you hear people all the time, you talk to them, you say, hey, you know, why don't we tell you about Jesus? Well, I'll tell you what, I believe in Jesus when he's standing in front of me. Really? Because I can read in the Bible a lot of places where God was right there and people didn't believe in him. Jesus was right there and they didn't believe in him. So what makes you any different? It's by faith and faith alone, right? So 603,000 cowards minus four or five people, Moses. Joshua, Caleb. Can you imagine when they went back home and God said you're going to wander for the next 38 years how mad the wives were? What? Why didn't you go and fight? Now we're going to wander for 38 years. So, moving into verse 30, uh, 47. We will see later on also, this is a, a, a point of note, you'll notice it later, that the second census, when they take it, there are a little less guys, about 602,000 guys, roughly. So about the same number are going to be going in, actually going into the land as what they have now. So verse 47, but the Israelites, I'm sorry, but the Levites were, list, were not listed among them by their ancestral tribe. For the Lord spoke to Moses saying, only the tribe of Levi you shall not list and you shall not take a census of them among the people of Israel. But appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings and they shall take care of it and shall camp around the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And if an outsider comes near, check this out, he shall be put to death. So this task was strictly for the Levites. Everyone else had other jobs. God said this is their job. And no one else is to do this. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp and each man by his own standard. But the Levites, verse 53, but the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may, may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus did the people of Israel. They did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So God had a, had a specific plan for the Levites and then the other 12 tribes. Now you may ask yourself, you go, wait a minute. He called out 12 tribes and the Levites are part of Levi. And that's a tribe. So how do we have 12 tribes plus the Levites? Remember back in Exodus where we have 
to get back even further, back in, in, in Genesis, where we have um, Jacob giving the blessing to Joseph's uh, kids. Remember, he brings them in. There's Manasseh, and I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the second one, but he has two kids, brings them in, and then he blesses them, and then later on they, they call him as part of their own tribe. And so when you go through the tribe, the listings of the, the tribes of Israel, sometimes you'll see that Manasseh takes the place of, some of Levi, and so it can be a little confusing. But the 12 tribes had their people numbered out, and then Levites were, were numbered out as well. So I could be a little confusing. Um, but it's okay. God has a plan. He's got it all under control. So you can see that the, the Levites have a job, right? They get to dismantle this thing, pack it up, move it to where it's going, put it back together. And, and as we went through and read how the tabernacle was built, you know this isn't something light. These are some seriously heavy materials that they've made this thing out of. So it wasn't a simple job. It wasn't like, yay, I get to be a Levite. I get to do It's like, oh, wow, that's a pretty serious work. But the work at the temple has always been serious work, hard work. Uh, can you imagine being Aaron and sacrificing from sun up to sundown? How exhausting would that be, right? So, but all done to the glory of God and, and presence of God and for the worship of God. So uh, that's how it is. So the Levites, they, they camped around the tabernacle. You, when you set your temp, tent up in another tribe, you did not camp next to the tabernacle set up. You had, you had the Levites around it. You were on the outside of the Levites. You weren't beside it. So the, um, the Levites camped around the tabernacle, which stood in the center of the camp, right? So everywhere, this God's being in the center, and this is where worship would be held. Um, with the sons of Kohath on the south. So remember that the tabernacle was established to be set up in a certain direction every time. It wasn't like they just dropped it and said, let's just put it here. This is good. They had to set it in a direction. It would be facing east. So the sons of Kohath were on the south. The sons of Merari on the north. The sons of Gershom were on the west. And then Moses and Aaron, they camped on the east side at the entrance to the tabernacle. That's where they would camp. And so in this way, the Levites protected the t tabernacle from anyone intruding it. So in order to get to the tabernacle, you had to go through an enormous number of people, an enormous number of campsites to get to even the walls of the tabernacle. So wasn't like you just went running along and ran right in there. They were going to slow you down. You don't go to the tabernacle unless you go in this way. You don't come pushing on the gates or anything. So everything about it was holy. And so they, that's their job was to take care of it. Um, and on top of that, they were close to it. So when the cloud decided to move and God says, it's time to move, we're going. And, he, and the cloud is leaving. They can see it really quick. Oh, the cloud's gone. There's probably some noise that goes along with that. I don't think it was like a, you know, it's not like an electric car. My guess is probably more like a ram truck. Blah, 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 blah. The cloud's sort of leaving. It's sort of how I visualize God leaving. He's not quiet. He's the mighty God. You know, he's, he's making some noise. So it could be wrong, but um, this is how I kind of play it in my head when I think of this cloud moving, is that, you know, we, we hear about him. He's on the mountain. There was, what, lightning and thunder and rumbling, which scared the people. So I'm thinking, when he moved this cloud, there was probably a little, little commotion. But they would be close, and they would say, hey, you know what? Time to move. Time to pack up. It's time to get going. And these guys had to be on it because it couldn't like, be lackadaisical and take their time putting this thing together. Um, and because of the important ministry as assistance to the priest, they were exempted from their military service. But the military service, you're only being called into it when we're going into battle. This service, the service at the tabernacle, was continuous. It didn't stop. And so it was the most important structure in the whole camp, right? So that they, had to, uh, they had to take care of it, and they were only the priests and the Levites could attend to it. No one else was allowed to attend to it. And so they were, they were counted out. So God gave them a, a, an exemption based on their service to him. And so lastly, you know, for us, warfare and worship may seem a little, you know, unrelated. Kind of look at that. That's a little weird, worship and warfare. But in God's economy, in God's scope, they go together. You know, so like, wait a minute. So unless the people of God are right with him, and we're going to see this, unless they're right with the Lord in worship, right, they're not going to face their enemies well. They're not going to do well. So in order to do well in, in battle and uh, conquering the land, they had to be right with the Lord. We're going to see that, especially later on in this book, 
And we're going to see that in Joshua where they decide to do things on, oh, we'll do this now because we can go take this. You know, they, but they didn't ask the Lord. They didn't seek him out. They didn't worship him to figure out what, what do you really want us to do, God? And so they weren't going to defeat their enemy when they weren't right with the Lord. And we're in the same today, guys. If you're not right with the Lord, if you're not in worship of the Lord, if you're not in communion with the Lord, we go to take on the world, the world's going to hammer you. It's going to absolutely beat you up. It already beats us up when we're in communion with the Lord, but at least we have him as our covering, and we're able to go to him and, and seek him and sort of that refuge, and we know that he's there with us, that reassurance that the Holy Spirit is with us. And it's not that the Holy Spirit's away from us if we haven't prayed that day or didn't read the Bible that day. But when you're in your word and you're in prayer with the Lord, man, the worries of the world just sort of melt away or at least become less you know, important because you realize what's important, and that's worshiping the Lord. And so here in Psalm 149.6, this is a great T-shirt idea, David, if you're watching. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. That's out of Psalms 149.6. So I could see that in the little teeny Marine Corps emblem, David. But, um, and we'll see that later on, right in Nehemiah, when they're building back the city. They'll be working with one hand and a sword in the other hand. So, as we study the book of Numbers, we can ask, how does the Old Testament book apply to me today, right? We're going through it. And one of the major themes, one of the major theological themes, if you will, that are developed in the New Testament from, uh, Testament from uh, Numbers is that sin and unbelief, especially rebellion, reap the judgment of God. So sin and unbelief, especially rebellion, re reap that judgment of God. 1 Corinthians specifically says this about that, and Hebrews touches on it as well, that these events, the events in Numbers, were written as examples to believers to observe and to avoid these uh, areas of failure, right? We're not to set our hearts on evil things, verse 6. Be sexually immoral, verse 8. This is on 1 Corinthians. Uh, be put, you know, put God to the test. We're not to do that. We're not to gripe or complain. We need to remember that last one. I think a lot of times we're like, well, I'm not doing evil things. I'm not being sexually immoral. I, I'm not putting God to the test. Well, are you whining? Are you complaining? Are you griping about your lot in the world? Oh, the world's not fair to me. Well, the world's not fair to anybody. Right? The world doesn't care. I tell my kids all the time. The world does not care about you. Not about you. So just as the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years because of the rebellion, so too does God sometimes allow us to wander without him. So, and we can suffer loneliness. We can have a lack of blessings when we rebel against him, when we gripe against him, when we're unthankful. But the other beauty is that God is faithful and he's just. And just as he restored the Israelites, he can restore us. Right? We can have that that uh, perfect relationship with the Lord. Anyway, he will restore Christians to a place of blessing and intimate fellowship with him if we repent and we return to him, as we see in 1 John 1, 9. So with that, let's close in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for the time we had to spend in your word, Lord. What an awesome, what an awesome history, Father God. Lord, I thank you that uh, you are a just and merciful God. Lord, I, I just want to uh, repent for my, my griping, my complaining, uh, the, the times that I just, um, I just don't look towards the blessings that you've given me, Father God. I ignore those blessings, Father, and I look to the things that aren't going right in my life or the challenges I might have, Father. So, Lord, forgive me for those. Lord, give me a grateful heart. Give each of us that grateful heart, Lord. And Father, just, uh, we just ask for your blessing this week. Give us opportunities to speak into others' lives, those that are hurting, those that are complaining, those that feel unloved, Lord, and those that don't know you, Father God. And give us the boldness to speak truth to them, share the love of your Son, the great story of the gospel, Lord, and just uh, to uh, have the opportunity to maybe pray with someone, Lord. Father, what a blessing that would be, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.